it's wonderful to have you on my show. I've had particular interest in cannabis because I've been watching the development and the legalization of cannabis, not just in the US over many more years, but obviously more recently in South Africa, and it's becoming more and more to the fore. So I have to ask you the question, tell me about biodata. Why now? What is it doing? Why in, the, in this whole cannabis industry, which as we know, offers so much potential for natural med medicines and solutions for patients? Hi, Giselle. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, so, so Biodata, I formed it about five years ago. Um, it was actually when I wanted to look at more research. So I started looking at uh, research in general. My background is a little bit, so just so you understand, I come from Vitel Consortium, where I used to do um, clinical trials and research on HIV vaccine studies, PrEP studies, um, and that's where I, I, I started. And then when I started learning more about cannabis and ethnomedicines and I became a practitioner, as well as an Ayurvedic practitioner, I said, no, let's just do more research about this so we can bring it to doctors to show them what it's about. So Biodata then uh, transformed uh, into a research unit looking at cannabinoids and cannabis as well as ethnomedicines. And we just started, we, I just started with a small patient database using case studies and then just documenting everything on those patients um, with regards to blood tests, pathology tests from the protocols I gave them and I started developing it. So it's been an, an interesting journey. And then now in Biodata about a month ago, we've just received the first ethics approval, a pharma ethics approval for the first medical cannabis study in South Africa, which is really exciting and huge. And we're looking at replacing um, opioids with cannabis and for pain management. And that's what Biodata is busy doing at this current moment. And that's, I mean, it's an extraordinary turnaround. If you think about five or six years ago, you know, if you were, if you were found with cannabis, you'd go to jail. And mm -hmm. now we are in the midst of a start of a study that may, that, that I believe, because we know there are other studies overseas, right, Dr. Gatto, that have already proven that it can be used for pain management. When we're talking about pain management, we're not talking about a small little headache or something or a small wound. We're really talking about people who live in chronic pain conditions. I mean, we've come a long way from cannabis being a substance that you could go to jail for if you had it in your possession. And your study, I mean, essentially, and we'll, we'll discuss why, why you need to do a study in South Africa, because as we know, first of all, the can, cannabis is being legalized. It's started in other countries around the world. South Africa has followed suit. And your study is a South African study, but there are other studies in the US. So perhaps you can explain why it's important that Biodata um, commits to a local study. That's the first thing. And perhaps also as someone in the medical field, you can explain the modality of pain. Because I think when people think about pain, you know, we think about a pain in the head or small pain. But what you're talking about with these kind of studies is really acute chronic pain. And for that, you would need very acute chronic medicine, which would have, in many cases, as we know, this pain category has just been recently highlighted in the US. There are these lawsuits happening um, against companies because people, um, some people have a tendency to get addicted to these painkillers and they have very devastating effects. So perhaps you can unpack that for us in the context of how this is all going to be navigated um, in South Africa. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so you're 100% correct, Giselle. There's a lot of studies that's been done. Uh, I've actually been working with my partners in Canada as well, and we've done a, done a similar um, study as well. So but we wanted to look at it in the South African context, using the South African population to just get enough information. You know, it's important to do research so doctors and scientists can evaluate, evaluate the potential benefits and harm of medication. As you know, with cannabis, there's a huge stigma attached to it, you know, with, with, with it being banned previously. And the doctors are very resistant to actually go and prescribe it and, because they don't know enough about it. So by doing a study like this, that's proudly South African, our South African doctors will see, look, here's a study done. This is what our population uh, looks like with regards to pain management. Does it work? Doesn't it work? And they will feel a little bit less um, uncertain about the medicine. And they would show, you know, we were able to show them further recent evidence in South Africa. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence that exists and I've been publishing 
some of that, but I just feel a purely observational study uh, using, uh, using 1,000 participants as well, um, you know, gives us a nice sample size. So to answer your second question, you know, why cannabis in regards to pain management, um, something interesting, Giselle, the first um, medical cannabis that was actually approved by the FDA was called Sativex. And Sativex was actually used to treat pain in patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, so multiple sclerosis, you know, patients really have hectic, hectic, chronic pain and with, in their nerves and the entire body. Some of them end up in wheelchairs. And then they actually found that the NSAIDs, which is your normal painkillers, were actually not giving those patients relief. So that goes to show that cannabis has its place with regards to hectic, uh, chronic pain, you know, medication to replace that. When we look at opioids, uh, look, don't get me wrong, opioids definitely have been effective in pain management. However, this, they, you know, they distribute a show a plethora of the side effects, especially dependence, as you mentioned, and death and overdose. It's a highly, highly addictive substance. You know, we have many doctors that are trying now to get their patients off uh, opioids, and it's, they, they, they're battling, and, and it's really difficult. Uh, whereas cannabis, on the other hand, and why are we actually doing this study to look at, you know, can cannabis replace pain, um, opioids for pain management, no one has ever overdosed on herbal medicinal cannabis. Um, and the scientific reason is there are actually no brainstem receptors. So it is very safe and effective. So um, that is why we're looking at, you know, doing this, this specific study with patients with hectic chronic pain, like fibromyalgia, um, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, those patients that really have that pain threshold that's so bad, but they're so scared or, or the opioids give them the pain management, but has the other side effects, as I mentioned. So that is basically the reason. And in terms of South Africa, do you, is it, it, why don't we just adopt some of the studies that have been done overseas? What makes South Africans different to Americans or to Israelis or to the Dutch, you know, with, with, and I know there are a lot of these studies have been conducted, all the Canadians. So, you know, for South Africa, you know, it's nice to actually look at our population. We have, you know, different race groups, uh, different way of eating. Uh, the way we live is different. Our um, topography is different. Things that we do are different. So it's important to, when you look at research, you know, we, we can't, you can't actually just generalize what you put in, like where you say, this could be, uh, taken to the broader public, but I wanted to do it in South Africa so we can say this is now done in South Africa with our population. This is the race group. This is the age group. This is the amount of people that have this specific disease and this specific um, cannabis. We are also looking at, you know, in, in South Africa using the South African um, cannabis as well um, with regards to the way it's grown here. Uh, there's various factors as well with regard to the oil and the bud and all of that. So we want to just make it a proudly South African study combining everything um, and, and then look comparing it as well to other published evidence. We don't know what we're going to find. However, there's about 1,100 articles that show that cannabis can alleviate chronic pain. And we just want to add to that body of evidence for this country to say this is what was actually done in South Africa. Um, because, you know, we, we don't have such a hectic opioid crisis as the um, as the US as such, but however, we still have a, have a problem. I can just give you some stats. In 2018, uh, we had 17,029 patients in South Africa that overdosed on opioids. Um, and according to the World Drug Report, 53 million opioid users, uh, they are worldwide. And of that 53 million, two thirds actually overdosed. So, you know, we could also be going in that direction if you look at the stats for 2018. So we want to just try and see, prevent things like that, use it proudly South African and try and prevent uh, the, the issues that are going on in the US with regards to the opioids. Obviously, those stats are hectic. I mean, you know, people dying from, from opioids because they, they're depressed or they commit suicide or, or their other side effects. I mean, I think that's just absolutely horrific. And so this concept of medical cannabis is a great concept. We know though that dosages are, are quite, you know, finding the exact dosage per person. And then also the strains. I mean, you alluded to the fact that we, you're going to be researching with South African strains. And for many people who are not aware of cannabis, obviously each plant or strain of plant is different. 
and the conditions in which they're grown in. And you can explain more about that. I mean, it's actually a fascinating area altogether. And I know you've done a lot of research. You're almost like <laughs> an expert in this. Perhaps you can explain like, in that research what you're going to be looking at in terms of those. So would you be testing different strains? You're obviously going to be testing the different um, amounts, um, uh, uh, concentrates of the compounds. And at the end of it, what do you hope to achieve? What what happens at the end of that research? Okay, great. So I can just tell you a little bit more about the research so you guys can gain the context. So we, we are looking to recruit 1,000 patients. And of those 1,000 patients, we looking at four visits in order for us to collate results for the entire year. So we obviously would uh, recruit patients within the year. Then we, we have a group of do doctors. There's about six of us uh, doctors that will be prescribing medical cannabis specific for each patient. And that's what's different when you look at opioids and you look at medical cannabis. That treatment protocol, or we call it microdosing, will be specific for each of that patient based on their tolerance and then their pain level. So they have to fill in questionnaires. We'll then need to evaluate all of that data, write everything up, and then uh, you know provide reports and all of that. So what, yes, we are looking at specific strains, which we'll be, we're gonna be uh, uh, testing. Uh, we've got some now from an aquaponics facility that we've been um, looking at to compare. Um, you know, we found that the indica strains help a little bit more with regards to pain, but if a patient has um, a deep depression, then we can't use the indica strain. We have to use a little bit more of the sativa strain, which is the more invigorating strain. So we have to take all of that into consideration because when we dose patients with cannabis, and because cannabis works on this endocannabinoid system, which is a biological regulatory system, it's not only about that pain. We need to take everything into context about that patient. What other um, what other disorders or illnesses or ailments do they have? What other medication are they on? We need to look at uh, drug interactions. So it's not just simple as like where you can give someone, oh, you have a pain, you yeah, take um, this uh, Atcadol or Mapradol or morphine and you, you know go away with it. It's not gonna be that um, easy. So we're looking at a more holistic approach. So we're looking at different strains, which is gonna be patient individual. So each doctor that we have on the team will be prescribing a specific dose and a strain for that patient. And then we're gonna put all the data together. So we're looking at a combination of the flower as well as the oil. We're also looking at some uh, medication, uh, you know, uh, that we're also using on a section 21. So we're trying to, to look at everything holistically and then combine all the data. And it's also something new for us in South Africa. So what we're doing is we're trying our best with I'm looking at uh, protocols and research done in other countries because we haven't done this before in South Africa from, on a patient space. We've done other studies, but cannabis is so different compared to other uh, other drugs, as I mentioned. So uh, yeah, so we're going to be looking and comparing, and then putting them in little cohorts. And then obviously, when we get the results, it'll take a whole team together to put everything and write everything up to make sure we we publish to to show clarity on which strains work for what. Um, well, how was the pain relief, which is specific strain, and then put everything together with other things that we may find out that we probably didn't even know. So it's exciting because everything in research is unknown. You don't know what your outcome is going to be. And that, I guess, is exciting. Um, and we'll just have to, to go with the flow and, and see how, how everything goes. And Dr. Gallo, I mean, obviously, once that research is done and concluded, let's say um, it comes out, well, we're certainly going to give more specific and accurate um, indications. For, for people who are growing and obviously then people who are extracting and then the people who are using end product. Because I understand at the moment, a lot of the cannabis available in South Africa right now is not locally extracted or grown. We're still importing a fair amount of it. I mean, you can see it all in the shops, uh, left, right and center. And we, we're in the early days of the licenses being granted and all the manufacturing plants, you know, getting to the levels at which are required. So, Logically, it seems to me that all these efforts are going to see almost an explosion um, of more medically oriented products. So not the, the, the stuff that's, that's kind of, <laughs> you know, in, in that domain, which is not really proven to help specific medical conditions. But this is going to go a long way to doing that. Yes, 100%. No, definitely. I've also uh, recently uh, been working, actually it's a year and a half with my partners in Canada to actually bring in registered medicines to South Africa. They're obviously from Canada, but they're all going to be plant-based and we're looking at you know, how we can just get something in quicker because 
in South Africa, um, Giselle, just so you understand how SAPRO, the legislation works, that we have a new medicine that's proudly South African that doesn't exist with SAPRO or in another country that's been registered. We have to do clinical trials formally to prove that that specific medicine does work. And that's, you know, it's quite a long process, which means doctors will have to wait four to five years to be able to prescribe medical cannabis in this country. And our patients, you know, they're going to end up in opioids, end up overdosing. There's going to be increased deaths, the health goes down. So I've done that. So our doctors here can at least have access to medical cannabis, which is safe, which is affected, which is licensed in other countries. And doctors are currently pres prescribing it and bring it into South Africa so we can actually start uh, prescribing for patients so doctors get used to it. By the time the South African market opens up and we then get into our, our trials and what we want to do for proudly South African um, medication, the doctors already have that confidence. So I just did that to try and speed it, uh, speed things up, just to allow access to to have so patients can have access to medical cannabis that's going to be prescribed by a medical doctor. So I know that you are doing your PhD, um, another one, <laughs> and I was quite intrigued to see that you're doing it and you're looking at prostate cancer. Do you, could you give us a little bit of insight, or is that a secret? Look, I'm, I'm just uh, busy uh, starting. I, I wanted to do prostate cancer because, as I mentioned, when Biodata started, we are looking at anecdotal evidence as case studies. And I had really, really good results, Giselle, on prostate cancer for some reason, uh, you know, when, when we are looking at it in a whole. So I thought, let's just let's just do it more formally. So what I'm doing for my PhD, um, I'm comparing uh, three cohorts of patients. So one will be patients that are on prostate, uh, have prostate cancer, but are only taking medical cannabis, obviously by their choice, they don't want to take any other treatment. The second is the second group of patients that are taking medical cannabis as well as going for radiation and chemotherapy by their choice. And the third cohorts are going to be patients that don't want to take cannabis at all, but are only doing the radiation and chemotherapy. And then I'm going to compare those three cohorts to say, you know, which is effective because no such thing exists. There's no study that exists to show any effectiveness. And then uh, I'm going to use the PSA, which is a prostate specific antigen test that I'm going to measure over a period of time. And then I'm going to measure the actual, uh, you look, look at the PET scans and then actually measure the tumor sizes and look at if it has a decreased, increased or what's happened. And it's exciting to see what the results are, because as I mentioned, we have anecdotal evidence. I don't have anything with proper research, which is what I'm doing. So I thought it's a great way to get a PhD, a second one, and then also look at cannabis and get something really great out of it that I can publish as well um, and write up. So one last question to you. I mean, it's incredible that you are the only South African to be appointed to the Society of Cannabis Commissions in the UK and the US. And I, I know too that you are a special advisor to the South African government. I mean, you, you've, 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 you've worked um, for many um, uh, academic institutions in South Africa. So that uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that and how that's opened um, maybe new insights to you and, and how South Africa fits in this world of cannabis clinicians? Yeah, so yeah, so it's, it's been a really big honor for me uh, to be appointed as the one and only South African onto that board of directors. I was, it was, a, it was a really hectic interview process. I was interviewed like three times from all over the world, but it was really exciting. And I've learned, I'm learning and I have learned so much being on this society because what's exciting, it's doctors and scientists from across the globe that have formed this, that have expertise in cannabis. And when I look at, you know, what they know, I feel you're inadequate. Like I need to learn so much more. Um, and it's a great platform because we are always learning. We have course material. Uh, I'm also going to be bringing it, it to a chapter into South Africa as well, the Society of Cannabis Clinicians into South Africa. I'm working on that with the US um, and UK team now at the moment and how are we going to do it? So it's basically like Giselle, how in South Africa we have the HPCSA, which is where all medical doctors and professionals are registered under that body. So we're looking at the Society of Cannabis Clinicians for, for, for specialist clinicians that are, that are cannabis clinicians that understand it. And there'll be training, um, a global training and everything for those clinicians. So we, we are really behind to be very honest when it comes to prescription, because we haven't really done, no one's prescribing yet. So, you know, we're just working a little bit with a few cohort of doctors, uh, but in the other countries, it's so huge. So for me to be on this uh, prestigious board, I've, I've been learning so much. I'm trying to bring my knowledge, share it to my doctors, my team that I have here, as well as other, other doctors. We, we brainstorm, put a lot of stuff together. 
I've also written some material for Australia as well. Um, so I think the, the international collaboration is so great because we are still learning here. And yes, we have specific strains that we still need to study in this country. Like for example, the Pondo land strain, Durban poison, all of that that are proudly South African, but we need um, medical professionals from across the globe that have been doing this for so many years, prescribing, seeing how it works on patients. Uh, and they just give me that comfort uh, when I speak to them, because if I'm not sure of something, I go straight to one of the experts there and say, please help. Uh, with the situation and scenario and and, and we, we brainstorm put everyone's heads together and we come with solutions so it's, it's been really exciting for this field to take the field forward and then one last question i have i mean we've seen how rooibos for example has become a global phenomenon now obviously that's something very peculiar and particular to south africa but our cannabis strains are also very particular and i think they world renowned when 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 they were completely illegal um i've seen documentaries where you know um these cannabis hunters used to come and and get the seeds so that they could go and sell it in places where it wasn't illegal mm -hmm. and i'm just again curious about whether you think there will be a move by um uh, the authorities to protect um what is what are south africans resources i mean these are very specific plants um, grown, um, created in Africa. Yes, 100%. You actually uh, hit the nail on the head. So I am also working with some strain hunters as well that, you know, try to we look at specific strains in South Africa and look at how we can, you know, incorporate that. For example, Giselle, the Durban poison strain has actually lost that strain. It's been registered overseas. Not, it's not registered as a South African strain. So part of my work with governments, um, as well as the strain hunters, is to protect exactly what you're saying, is to protect our, our South African strains. The one strain we're looking at is the land race for Pondo land. Uh, Pondo Gold, we've been doing some research, um, professor in the Free State has been doing some research um, on breast cancer cell lines and that specific strain with Im it, like impeccable results. So I would like to bring that research into humans once he's finished with his cell lines and, and, and the animals and bring it into human studies and we want to protect it. So we have spoken to governments when we're trying to change legislation and put things in to say we need to actually protect these trends. So yes, to answer your question, we definitely looking at ways in which we can. We don't want what happened to Durban poison to happen to the other strains here in South Africa. We want to keep them proudly South African registered here. And that can also help our economy as well, where people can then source the seeds, you know, from our strain hunters in our, in our country.